Hello, fifth graders. Welcome to day two of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. As we're getting started today, you're going to need your copy of the book. And again, maybe paper and pencil, depending on if you're writing down answers or not. And again, if you're struggling with the homework, I encourage you to write down answers as you go. It will really help a lot as you're moving. So first things first, we're going to take a look at homework from last time, and then we'll get into today's reading. So number one asked, what are the two names of the town in which the story is set? You should have picked Greensburg and Terrytown. What is one quote that describes what the valley is like? Lots of quotes you could have picked. Um, one of the quietest places in the whole world is a great one. You could have described small brook glides through it. Just murmur enough to lull one to a repose. Uh, this idea of uniform tranquility, that's really what I was looking at, is just that this was a quiet, a very quiet, exceptionally quiet valley. What is the glen called? It's called Sleepy Hollow. What do people see and hear? They see strange sights and hear music and voices at Sleepy Hollow. The dominant, fig uh, dominant spirit is a figure on horseback without a head. What is the spirit's name? You should have had the spirit's name is the Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow. Seven, what always seems to happen when people live near Sleepy Hollow? They always seem to see ghosts, see visions. And then mood, in terms of mood, we really should have had scary, frightening, something along those lines, okay? So many quotes that you could have used to support that answer, right? Anything about apparitions or spirits given to strain, all kinds of marvelous beliefs, subject to trances and visions, frequently see strange sights, hear music and voices in the air, haunted spots, twilight superstitions, nightmare with her whole nine fold seems to make it the favorite scene of her gambles. Just a couple of quotes. There really are so many that you could have picked from these first pages to support your answer. But again, the, the mood being set for the story, one of fear, one of um, being scared, okay? So for today, we're going to be reading pages 10 through 18. <clears throat> we're also meeting our new character, Ichabod Crane. So number one asks, what is Ichabod Crane's job? Two, which relates to our objective, which is describing Ichabod Crane's appearance. What is one quote that describes what Crane looked like? So one quote that describes what Crane looked like is blank. Three, what is another quote that describes what Crane looked like? Another quote that describes what Crane looked like is... Number four, it is said that Ichabod Crane's scholars certainly were not spoiled. What does this mean? Five, of what was Ichabod Crane a perfect master? So this one, you're going to have to do a little bit of thinking it through, and I'll walk you through it with explanation. This one is directly in the text. Six, how did Ichabod Crane ease his fears after reading his direful tales? Seven, what causes more perplexity to mortal man than ghosts, goblins, and the whole race of witches put together? So as I mentioned when I flipped the camera around, fifth graders, our objective is going to be describing this character of ours physically, his physical description, okay? So we're picking back up on the bottom of page 10. So we're gonna go ahead and get there. So in this by place of nature, their abode means their lives or lived in a remote period of American history. That is to say some 30 years since. So this is kind of giving us a hint that the story being told happened about 30 years ago, okay? So there lived about 30 years ago in this area, a worthy what of the name of Ichabod Crane, who sojourned, or as he expressed it, Terry, to remember Terry Town, in Sleepy Hollow, for the purpose of, dis of instructing the children of the vicinity. Hmm. So question one, and it tells us that he lived there, or tarried there, as he said, for the purpose of instructing the children of the, of the vicinity. Instruction. What is that? If we're instructing children, what are you doing? 
you're listening to someone who does that. Me. I'm that someone. Big hint. Okay? He was a native of Connecticut. Means he's from Connecticut. A state which supplies the Union with pioneers for the mind as well as for the forest. And sends forth yearly its legions of frontier woodmen and country schoolmasters. The cognomen... Cognomen is a fancy word for last name. So when we say the cognomen, his last name is Crane. So the cognomen of Crane was not inapplicable to his person. Let's unpack that sentence. So he's saying his last name, Crane, was not inapplicable. It's a double negative. So just like in math, if you have two negatives, it makes it a positive, right? So not inapplicable means that it does apply. It applies to him. So his last name of Crane applies to him. So that's talking about his physical description, okay? So if you were to describe him as being like a crane, that would be applicable. That would apply, okay? How? Let's read on. He was tall, but exceedingly lank. Okay, so tall and skinny with narrow shoulders, long arms and legs, hands that dangled a mile out of his sleeves, feet that might have served for shovels, and his whole frame most loosely hung together. So, so far we see he's tall, he's super skinny, really skinny shoulders, really long arms and legs. His hands are huge, his feet they're saying are so big they could almost be like a shovel, okay? And it all kind of loosely hung together. His head was small and flat at the top with a huge ears, large green glassy eyes, and a long snipe nose so that it looked like a weathercock perched upon his spindle neck to tell which way the wind blew. So you have to imagine he's got a small head, but huge ears, huge eyes, and a long nose. It's describing, if you've ever seen a weathercock, it's like those arrows that are on top of a, of a house and they spin in the wind. So his nose is like a long arrow that you would see on top of like farmhouses a lot have them. To see him striding along the profile of a hill on a windy day with his clothes bagging and floating about him, one might have mistaken him for the genius of famine descending upon the earth, or some scarecrow eloped from a cornfield. So famine is like starvation. So they're saying if you saw him walking along on a hill, you'd look at that and say, is that like starvation come to life here on earth? Or you might mistake him also, it says, of some scarecrow who just like got up and started walking. So you can kind of get a picture of him, tall, super skinny, Long arms and legs, huge feet, big hands, small head, but big ears and big eyes and a big long nose. And he's so skinny, he looks like starvation itself or like a scarecrow. Okay. So as we think about this objective in questions two or three, I just gave you tons, tons. And remember, when you're answering questions two and three, restating the question as you do so. Okay. His schoolhouse, hmm, another hint for number one. His schoolhouse was a low building of one large room. Maybe some of you have talked to your grandparents about one room schoolhouses, which used to be the case, right? We learn now kind of with children of the same age, but it used to be that if you were in a small town, you would just teach everyone all in one room. There'd be one teacher and like all the grades and they'd all get taught. You could ask your grandparents about that. They might they might have been there, or at least great-grandparents. Great Maybe your grandparents would be offended that I'm even saying that. Great-grandparents, for sure, okay? His schoolhouse was a low building of one large room, rudely constructed of logs, the windows partly glazed and partly patched with leaves of old copybooks. It was most ingeniously secured at vacant hours by a withe twisted in the handle of a door and stakes set against the window shutters, so that though a thief might get in with perfect ease, he would find some embarrassment getting out, an idea most probably borrowed by the architect Joost van Houten from the mystery of an eel pot. So the door of his schoolhouse is like a door that swings both ways, okay? So if you're thinking about like, 
okay? And so if you're trying to get into his schoolhouse, you could like push it open, okay? Push it open and get into his schoolhouse. But then there would be these stakes resting on the outside. So you could push it in, but then when you try to get out, it would bang up against that. So you couldn't get out. So he, he basically got it so people could get into the schoolhouse. But once they were in, they'd be stuck and then he could catch them. The schoolhouse stood in a rather lonely but pleasant situation just at the foot of a woody hill with a brook running close by and a formidable birch tree growing at one end of it. From hence, the low murmur of pupils' voices conning over their lessons might be heard in a drowsy summer's day, like the hum of a beehive, interrupted now and then by the authoritative voice of the master in the tone of menace or command, or peradventure by the appalling sound of the birch as he urged some tardy loiterer along the flowery path of knowledge. So in general, it's described peacefully, right? There's a hill and a brook and a tree, and generally you can kind of hear students doing their lessons. And then periodically it says his authoritative, menacing, commanding voice. So it sounds like he's kind of um, an aggressive teacher, okay? Uses a firm voice, or it tells us per adventure. So perhaps the appalling sound of the birch, appalling, which means this is a shocking sound. So when you think of a birch, this is like a birch tree. So the birch is describing a birch branch. As he urged some tardy loiterer along the flowery path of knowledge. So he used a branch to urge a student toward their learning. Okay, and again, the narrator describes this as appalling, shocking, to hear the sound of a branch urging someone to learn. Okay. So remember, this is an older story, so this wouldn't be uncommon, this idea of using some sort of punishment to urge someone to learn. But of course, nowadays, this was something that would absolutely not be acceptable, not be appropriate in any way. So this gets at our question four. Truth to say, he was a conscientious man and ever bore in mind the golden maxim, spare the rod, spoil the child. How many of you have ever heard that before? Something that maybe your parents could say or grandparents could explain. Spare the rod, spoil the child means if you don't use a rod or a branch to encourage your, your students to learn or your child to learn, they become spoiled. Okay, so in other words, he's saying if you don't hit kids, they'll become spoiled. This is a saying that was very common. Again, totally not appropriate now, not something that happens even remotely now, right? But that used to be said a lot. And so what we see now is this sentence, Ichabod Crane's scholars certainly were not spoiled, okay? So what does that mean? Spare the rod. So if you don't use a branch or something to beat the kids, they become spoiled. And he says his scholars were not spoiled. So what does that mean? We have to infer. This gives us a perspective about Ichabod, the way that he teaches, okay? The way that he instructs students with a, an authoritative voice, and with his birch, okay? I would not have it imagined, however, that he was one of those cruel potentates of the school who joy in the smart of their subjects. He doesn't like to do it, it says. On the contrary, he administered justice with discrimination rather than severity, taking the burden off the backs of the weak and laying it on those of the strong. Your mere puny stripling that winced at the least flourish of the rod was passed by with indulgence. But the claims of justice were satisfied by inflicting a double portion on some little tough, wrong-headed, broad-skirted Dutch urchin who sulked and swelled and grew dogged and sullen beneath the birch. All this he called doing his duty by their parents. And he never inflicted a chastisement without following it by the assurance, so consolatory to the smarting urchin, that he would remember it and thank him for it to the longest day he had to live. Okay, so the idea is that after he uses punishment, physical punishment to students, he tells them, you'll thank me for this someday. And our narrator is kind of being a little bit sarcastic here when the narrator says, 
so consolatory to the smarting urchin. So they're consolatory, excuse me. They're feeling so glad about it. Of course, this feels better, right? If you've gotten hit by your teacher and then they say, you'll thank me for it someday. It's not going to make you feel better, right? So the narrator's kind of being sarcastic about it at this point, okay? Sorry, fifth graders. Lots of things happening over here right now. When school hours were over, he was even the companion and playmate of the larger boys. So he kind of hangs out with them a little bit. And on holiday afternoons would convoy some of the smaller ones home who happened to have pretty sisters or good housewives for mothers, noted for the comforts of the cupboard. So he goes home and hangs out with some of the families, those who have pretty sisters or who have a lot of good food. He'll go hang out at their house, just hang out with the sisters and have the food. Indeed, it behooved him to keep on good terms with his pupils. The revenue arising from his school was small and would have been scarcely sufficient to furnish him with daily bread, for he was a huge feeder, and though Lank had the dilating powers of an anaconda, but to help out his maintenance, he was, according to the country custom in those parts, boarded and lodged at the houses of the farmers whose children he instructed. Sorry, fifth graders, the commotion was too much, so I changed, had to change locations. Uh, if you have a student or a, a sibling who's in sixth grade this year, they would say that this is where they saw me doing all my lessons in the spring. So, okay, so what does this mean? It says that he's a huge feeder, okay? A huge feeder means he, it means he eats a lot, okay? He eats a ton. It says he has the powers, of, dilating powers of an anaconda, which if you know anything about an anaconda, like it swallows a... a entire, you know, wildebeest hole or whatever, right? Anacondas are known because they eat a large amount all at once, right? And so um, what we're describing about Ichabod Crane is that he can eat a lot, okay? Um, but then it also tells us that it's the custom at this time that he lived, he boarded and lodged, which means he, eat, he ate and lived at the homes whose children he instructed. So imagine this, fifth graders, imagine. What this means is that I would like come live in your house. That would be a part, that'd be the whole thing, right? I'd teach you and then periodically I'd come and stay at your house for like a week at a time. Can you imagine? I mean, I'm basically in your house right now virtually, but imagine if I was literally coming and staying in your house and you were supposed to feed me and then we'd like talk at night and spend that our evenings together. Can you imagine? That would be a very different experience, okay? So, um... This is the description, right? So it's basically saying he wants to stay on good terms because A, he eats a lot and he needs food from these people and B, he lives with them, okay? With these, he lived successively a week at a time, thus going the rounds of the neighborhood with all his worldly effects tied up in a cotton handkerchief. So he would tie all his things up in a handkerchief and then he'd go from house to house a week at a time, okay? That all this might not be too onerous on the purses of his rustic patrons, who are apt to consider the costs of schooling a grievous burden, and schoolmasters mere drones, he had various ways of rendering himself both useful and agreeable. He assisted the farmers occasionally in the lighter labors of their farms, helped to make hay, mended the fences, took the horses to water, drove the cows from pasture, and cut the wood for the winter fire. He laid aside, too, all the dominant dignity and absolute sway with which he lorded it in his little empire, the school, and became wonderfully gentle and ingratiating. He found favor in the eyes of the mothers by petting the children, particularly the youngest. And like the lion bold, which while him so magnanimously the lamb did hold, he would sit with a child on one knee and rock a cradle with his foot for whole hours together. So what the narrator is telling us is on the one hand, Ichabod is very harsh in his classroom and he, he uses strong, harsh words and he uses physical um, punishments, okay? However, when he's staying with them, he's great with the kids, he's helpful. And that's the other thing, it says he helps around the house. So if I were like actually living with you guys, I'd help rake the leaves or shovel the snow or cook dinner or clean the dishes afterwards, right? So he kind of helps out in addition, okay? In addition to his other vocations, he was the singing master of the neighborhood and picked up many bright shillings by instructing the young folks in psalmody. So on top of that, he's like a singing teacher. It was a matter of no little vanity to him on Sundays to take his station in front of the church gallery with a band of chosen singers, where, in his own mind, he completely carried away the palm from the parson. 
so he's feeling pretty proud of his singing ability, right? And the narrator kind of gives us that at church on Sundays when he's singing, he, in his own mind, sort of takes it all away. He sings great. Certain it is, his voice resounded far above all the rest of the congregation. So the narrator tells us, he certainly sings louder than everybody else. And there are peculiar quavers still to be heard in that church, and which may even be heard a mile off, quite to the opposite side of the mill pond, on a still Sunday morning, which are said to be legitimately descended from the nose of Ichabod Crane. Okay, so we're being told he sings, certainly sings louder than everybody else. And they're talking about his singing coming from his nose. So you can imagine a lone singer who sings through his nose and maybe isn't very good, but is loud. In his own mind, however, he's an excellent, excellent singer. Interesting, okay? Thus, by diverse little makeshifts and that ingenious way which is common in, commonly denominated by hook and by crook, the worthy pedagogue, that's another word for a teacher, got on tolerably enough and was thought by all who understood nothing of the labor of headwork to have a wonderfully easy life of it. So in other words, he does kind of odds and ends to get by, right? He teaches the kids. He teaches singing. He goes and stays in the homes of his students and he helps around but also gets fed and boarded there. And so Basically, the description from the narrator is like, he does all right, right? He kind of puts it together and is able to make a living. And largely, the people of the town kind of think, like, how hard could that be, okay? The schoolmaster is generally a man of some importance in the female circle of the rural neighborhood. So the, the, the girls and the women of the area seem to th think of the teacher as a pretty, a pretty great person. Being considered a kind of idle, gentleman-like personage of vastly superior taste and accomplishments to the rough country swains, and indeed inferior in learning only to the parson. His appearance, therefore, is apt to occasion some little stir at the tea table of a farmhouse, and the addition of a supernumerary dish of cakes or sweetmeats, or peradventure the parade of a silver teapot. So it's kind of like a hubbub when he shows up. People are excited to have him mostly because he's pretty educated in comparison to the farmers of the area, and so they find him impressive. Our man of letters, therefore, was peculiarly happy in the smiles of all the country damsels. How he would figure among them in the churchyard between services on Sundays, gathering grapes for them from the wild vines that overran the surrounding trees, reciting for their amusement all the epitaphs on the tombstones, or sauntering with a whole bevy of them along the banks of the adjacent mill pond, while the more bashful country bumpkins hung sheepishly back, envying his superior elegance and address. So, fifth graders, what that means is we see that he kind of is spending time wandering, and there's women who are excited because he's very well educated, especially in comparison to maybe some of the people in the area who aren't, haven't gone to school. Um, their focus is farming, and so a lot of them stop going to school at a young age. So they kind of follow him along. But I also think that this is sort of a humorous commentary where he impresses them by his reading. He can read, and a lot of them can't read. And so the way that he impresses these women is by reading to them what's on the tombstones. So things like, here lies, you know, John Smith passed away 1842 or whatever and they're all kind of swooning like oh he can read the tombstones um so some of the other locals kind of stand back and it tells us at the end right the locals sort of hang back and and um because they can't read necessarily and so they don't really join in and so there's a little bit of excitement about Ichabod um you will notice I've changed locations again it's been one of those days so we continue. <clears throat> From his half itinerant life, also, he was a kind of traveling gazette, carrying the whole budget of local gossip from house to house, so that his appearance was always greeted with satisfaction. He was, moreover, esteemed by the women as a man of great erudition, for he had read several books quite through and was a perfect master of Cotton Mather's history of New England witchcraft, in which, by the way, he most firmly and potently believed. Okay, 
So look, some things happen in that paragraph. First, we find that people kind of like when he shows up because he brings gossip with him. So, did you hear that Johnny's mother does psh, 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 psh. <gasps> No way. But then you go to the next house and say, did you know that Shannon's grandpa does shh, shh, shh. <gasps> No way, right? So as he visits house to house, he kind of spreads gossip as he goes. And again, he's considered to be very a very learned person because he's read several books. Okay, so this gives you a perspective of kind of the area. Um, but we also learn, and this relates to question five, that he is very well read in this book about witchcraft by a gentleman named Cotton Mather. Um, so this is really kind of about like witchcraft and how to do spells and potions and how to read signs and how to, um, you know, see what's happening and, and try to, you know, have these different re things related to witchcraft, witchcraft. Okay. But we're told that he doesn't do it as kind of like a passing. Oh, that's interesting. It says he most firmly and potently believed it, which means Ichabod really truly is kind of fully believing in this book of witchcraft and how to do witchcraft, okay? He was, in fact, an odd mixture of small shrewdness and simple credulity. His appetite for the marvelous and his power of digesting it were equally extraordinary, and both had been increased by his residence in this spellbound region. Okay. So by the marvelous, this is talking about these supernatural things, right? He loves things that are supernatural and otherworldly, okay? Um, and he loves to read about it. Digesting it would be about, like, reading it, okay? And we're told that by living in Sleepy Hollow, it's only gotten more so because we know that as people live in Sleepy Hollow, they become more and more entranced by these things. No tale was too gross or monstrous for his capacious swallow, it was often his delight, after his school was dismissed in the afternoon, to stretch himself on the rich bed of clover bordering the little brook that whimpered by his schoolhouse, and there con over Mather's direful tales, until the gathering dusk of evening made the printed page a mere mist before his eyes. So he would sit after school and lie out and read from Cotton Mather's History of New England Witchcraft. Then, as he wended his way by swamp and stream and awful woodland to the farmhouse where he happened to be quartered, every sound of nature at that witching hour fluttered his excited imagination. The moan of the whippoorwill from the hillside, the boding cry of the tree toad, that harbinger of storm, the dreary hooting of the screech owl, or the sudden rustling in the thicket of the birds frightened from their roost. The fireflies, too, which sparkled most vividly in the darkest places, now and then startled him, as one of uncommon brightness would stream across his path. And if by chance a huge blockhead of a beagle came, beagle came winging his blundering flight against him, the poor varlet was ready to give up the ghost with the idea that he was struck with a witch's token. So we see, and you guys might relate to this, right? He sits and reads out of this book of witchcraft which has some stories in it that are terrifying him but he loves it right but the more he reads it the more it kind of sparks his imagination so it's like if you've ever read a scary book or watched a scary show or heard a scary story um afterwards you tend to have like a heightened awareness right every sound like a tree taps against the window and you're convinced that it's somebody tapping against the window right or there's your house kind of settles and it sounds like footsteps or um there's woo whipping around right your house in the with the wind and so that's what's happening right this idea of when he's engaging in these scary readings and then he kind of in his mind is imagining like what is that everything every basic nature thing is starting to seem like something scary to him his only resource on such occasions either to drown thought or drive away evil spirits so the only way to kind of drown out his thoughts so he doesn't think these scary things anymore was to sing psalm tunes. And the good people of Sleepy Hollow, as they sat by their doors of an evening, were often filled with awe at hearing his nasal melody in linked sweetness drawn out, floating from the distant hill or along the dusky road. So as he's doing his, as he's trying to recover from his singing, or from his fear, 
you can kind of hear him singing songs and it's trying to calm him down okay another of his sources of fearful pleasure was to pass long winter evenings with the old dutch wives <clears throat> as they sat spinning by the fire with a row of apples roasting and spluttering along the hearth and listened to their marvelous tales of ghosts and goblins and haunted fields and haunted brooks and haunted bridges and haunted houses and particularly of the headless horseman or galloping hessian of the hollow as they sometimes called him he would delight them equally by his anecdotes of witchcraft and of the direful omens and portentous sights and sounds in the air which prevailed in the earlier times of connecticut and would frighten them woefully with speculations upon comets and shooting stars and with the alarming fact that the world did absolutely turn around and that they were half the time topsy-turvy so you can kind of see as the author's going right so we see he continues to make some jokes here and there right we should be impressed by ichabod crane because he's read several books all the way through right or he shares the shocking fact with the, the housewife saying the world spins. <gasps> no. Now, we, reader, obviously know that that's true, but at the time, this might have been a shocking fact, okay? So he spends time where they tell him ghost stories, and he tells them things about witchcraft and tells them, oh, I saw a shooting star, and that means this bad thing, right? So he's kind of giving them these uh, terrifying readings of the signs. But if there was a pleasure in all this, while snugly cuddling in the chimney corner of a chamber that was all of a ruddy glow from the crackling wood fire, and where, of course, no specter dared to show its face, it was dearly, dearly purchased by the terrors of his subsequent walk homewards. In other words, if he found any joy in sitting and listening to ghost stories and telling about witchcraft, he paid for it later when he had to walk home outside in the dark by himself. What fearful shapes and shadows beset his path amidst the dim and ghastly glare of a snowy night? With what wistful look did he eye every trembling ray of light streaming across the waste fields from some distant window? How often was he appalled by some shrub covered with snow, which, like a sheeted specter, beset his very path? How often did he shrink with curdling awe at the sound of his own steps on the frosty crust beneath his feet and dread to look over his shoulder lest he should behold some uncouth being tramping close behind him and how often was he thrown into complete dismay by some rushing blast howling among the trees in the idea that it was the galloping hessian on one of his nightly scourings so again the same thing he's hearing these sounds and it's terrifying him he hears his own footsteps and thinks somebody's following him or he hears a blast of wind and it's gotta be the headless horseman all these however were mere terrors of the night phantoms of the mind that walk in darkness and though he had seen many specters in his time and been more than once beset by satan and divers shapes in his lonely perambulations Yet daylight put an end to all of these evils, and he would have passed a pleasant life of it, in despite of the devil and all his works, if his path had not been crossed by a being that causes more perplexity to mortal man than ghosts, goblins, and the whole race of witches put together. And that was a woman. All right, fifth graders. So hopefully you're getting a little bit of a feel of the book, right? There's these kind of this character who's very um, into ghost stories and witchcraft. He's, he's the local teacher. He spends time with all of the people of the city, of the village, of the town, we'd call it, I guess. And he's inclined to be into these sorts of things. Um, but now we see that what is the real thing that causes him perplexity, causes him confusion, more confusion than ghosts and goblins and witches and all the things that he's scared of, right? All right, so go ahead, answer those questions. Good luck, and as always, if you have questions, let me know.